Good morning. Our next presenter is Alexa Saray. He's a core developer and maintainer of RunC and Yumochi, contributor and maintainer of Open Container Initiative specifications, and a Linux kernel contributor. He works on the containers team at SUSE. Alexa will present uh, his talk in a pre-recorded video today and remain online for any questions that may occur during the video or at the end. Uh, now, pass it over to the video. Hello everyone, my name is Alexa. I'm glad you could make it. Um, today I'll be talking to you about Paperback, which is a digital will and backup system that I've been working on. Well, I sort of came up with the design in 2018 and then I worked on it a little bit here and there, but the project has really come together in the past year or so. Um, and yeah, so this is completely unrelated to my regular day job. I normally work on containers. Um, but yeah, this is sort of made to solve a particular problem that I had. Um, and hopefully it'll be interesting to all of you. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions on this. Um, and I would love to get some assistance with some of the bits that um, I'll talk about at the end of the talk. Um, so why do I say will and backup system? Uh, well, as you'll see in a second, um, it actually turns out that both of these problems, the problem of how to deal with um, wills and backups with digital assets, it turns out it turns out that they have very, very similar issues. Um, and so we'll, we'll go into that right now. So the first thing to consider is when it comes to wills. Now, before I start, I should say I'm definitely not a lawyer, not even slightly. Um, and so anything I say here um, is not actual legal advice or anything. Um, you should definitely speak to an actual lawyer about wills. Um, but at the moment, there it is actually practically quite, quite difficult to deal with digital assets and wills. Um, the primary reason being that for most digital assets, there isn't really a legally mediated med uh, method of transferring um, some sort of digital asset between people. Um, you have some online services where if you have a death certificate and you have have um, an order or whatever from um, from the executor of the, of the estate, you can actually uh, transfer a digital asset between people. Um, but in many cases, you have terms of service that don't allow you to even transfer accounts. Um, and then you have things like cryptocurrencies and stuff like that, where um, there is not even there is no mechanism to do um, to do a transfer, even if you did have all of the legal um, even if you the legal right to do the transfer. Um, and so as a result, the sort of solution that it gets thrown around is you want to, well, okay, just put your passwords or put your keys or whatever in your will. And then that way, when you know when you have the executor of the state, they actually have the data that's necessary. Um, the problem with this is that uh, it relies very, very heavily on lawyers and the OPSEC of the lawyers. And this is quite u a unique problem with digital assets, which doesn't apply to regular assets. I mean, if you think about it, like when you're saying, I will leave my house to my sister, Claire and to my son Peter, I'll do yada yada. Um, these um, that sort of case is like for physical assets. Uh, the the fact that you have it written in the will is not in of itself enough information to steal it. Like just because it says that you will give your house to X Y Z does not mean that that the inf that information itself is enough to actually steal the house. Um, at least you would hope not. And so therefore, this is sort of like a fairly new problem in that the will, um, maybe well, the will might be secret, but the will itself, even if you did have access to it, does not actually give you access to steal whatever it is that's in the will. Um, and unfortunately, for digital assets, this is not the case. For digital assets, in many in many cases, um, the information itself is the thing that is enough to um, to take it. And so therefore, unlike most secrets held by lawyers, um, you have the problem of it's sort of a unique ownership system where having the information is usually enough to say that you own it. But also, even, uh, in the case of cryptocurrencies and things like that, um, even if you could prove that it was stolen, there is no practical recourse, recourse for theft. I mean, if someone steals a house, you can always, you know, repossess it. Like, it, it's not it's not um, gone forever. This is not the case for cryptocurrencies. And, I mean, there are other examples, but cryptocurrencies is the most obvious one. Um, and, I mean, hopefully you trust your lawyer. If you don't, you should probably get a new one. Um, but you should also know that there have been thankfully rare cases of lawyers themselves stealing money from clients. Um, if you think of someone who has a lot of money in cryptocurrency wallet, or if they, or even if they have a very, very valuable digital asset of some kind, um, you're, you're sort of, um, you're in, you're in big trouble if your lawyer decides to just take it from you. Um, but as I said, I'm not a lawyer. Speak to an actual lawyer about wills. I suspect the paperback itself um, probably can't be used as a will unto itself uh, because, I, I don't know, there's probably some co sort of common law restriction that makes it not, not possible to use it. I'm not a lawyer, but... Um, I suspect that the only way you could really use paperback for an actual will um, would be if you were to take, um, you were to create, you were to draft the normal will, and in that will you would reference a paperback backup um, for the actual data required for the digital assets. I suspect that's how you would actually end up using this. Um, but again, speak to your actual lawyer if you actually do plan to use this for a real will. Um, so the rest of this talk, I'm not going to talk about wills. Um, I've only mentioned it here because, um, as you'll notice, this this sort of problem of well, we need to have a way for it to be recovered if I'm not there. 
this sort of problem actually is is very analogous to a problem with backups. Um, so the rest of the talk, I'll talk about backups, but just keep in mind that these two problems are actually um, fairly similar, at least in this particular case. Um, so we'll go into digital assets and backups. So there's a very similar problem um, with backing up a digital asset, which is that, okay, you have um, some sort of key or something. So, so you have a secret and you want to have it um, be safely backed up. So you want that secret to be distributed because if you were to just, you know, put that secret, um, like print it out, unencrypted on a piece of paper, well, you can't give that to your friends because now your friends have access to um, to, to the particular thing that, you, that, you're, that you're trying to protect. And so you therefore want to, either you would just have one copy that you keep in your house, but then if there's a house fire, the backup is basically useless. You know, you have the original and the backup both get destroyed. So instead, you would want to encrypt it. But then you have the problem of, well, how do I pick a key that is strong enough such that if I give this to my friend, they, they will not try to, dis uh, to break it, or if they try to break it, they would not succeed. Um, but if you have a secure enough key, now you have a problem of, well, I'm not going to be able to remember a key that is super complicated. Um, maybe I'll remember for a year or two, but I'm not, not going to remember for 30 years, uh, which is the, it's the sort of timeline you have to think about with, with certain types of backups. Um, because you probably don't want to be recreating a new backup every five years and annoying half your friends, you know, who knows where they move to. Um, so yeah, this, this, this is a pretty big problem. Um, and obviously now you have the same OPSEC issues you had before, except now it's not, it's not your lawyer's OPSEC or your lawyer's office's OPSEC. It is your OPSEC and the OPSEC of everyone, um, of everyone you've given a copy to. Just to give sort of the, a flavor for why I originally started working on this problem. Um, so I have a home server, you actually probably can see it in the background, um, that runs, you know, Nextcloud and a bunch of other things. And it has all of our legal documents and all of our photos and absolutely everything is uploaded there. Um, obviously pretty important stuff. And so I use a tool called Restic, which is by the way, pretty cool. If you don't, um, if you're looking for a cool encrypted backup solution, Restic is pretty good. Um, uh, it works pretty well, and I've never had it, I've not had any I've not had any issues with it. Um, so yeah, so I use Restic um, for encrypted and deduplicated backups um, with a key that I don't know, and we'll get into that in a second. So there's a re fully randomized key the server has that I don't know. Um, those that those backups are encrypted with that key, and then the backups are uploaded daily to Backblaze B2, which is um, you know some online um, you know uh, storage service. Um, could be uploaded anywhere. Um, but yes, but in order to recover my backups, I need that password as a key file, which I don't know. And so if you imagine sort of the recovery scenario we're dealing with, well, okay, everything gets destroyed. Um, all of my devices get destroyed. My server gets destroyed. Everything except for the um, online backup I have, which is sort of like the most extreme disaster scenario you can imagine. But surely a backup system should be able to handle this. So in this situation, I now... I don't know my I don't know the key phrase because if I had a simple key phrase that would be prone to attacks right like my while you know my upload is password protected you know it's sort of still out in the open in, in a sense um, so I can't use a simple key because that's prone to attacks um, but if I use a complicated key then uh, I need to have some way of backing that up because I'm probably not going to be able to remember that for you know for the rest of my life um, and then you have sort of, you can see this sort of be quickly becomes an infinite recursion. If you have a complicated key and you need a backup for that key, how are you going to back that up? And sure, it's less data to back up, I mean, presumably, uh, but, you know, it's still something that you now need to figure out a way to recover. So the solution to this problem, or I should say our solution to this problem, is a scheme developed in the 70s by Shamir, um, the SNRSA, uh, called Shamir Secret Sharing. Um, and so I'm going to go through sort of the nuts and bolts of how this scheme works. Um, you don't have to sweat it if you if you don't quite get it. Um, the mathematics is sort of like uh, first level uni, um, high school level mathematics, but it does take a little bit sort of to understand what's going on. Um, so if you don't get it, no worries. Um, I'm sure that if you went and through the Wikipedia article, it would all make sense. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just going to give you the quick overview because while it's not necessary to understand how paperback works, um, it is useful to understand how the scheme works so that you can understand how some of the other features work. Um, so yeah. Uh, so the general gist here is that using some fairly rudimentary algebra, which I'll get to in a second, you can take any secret you like and you can split it into K pieces. So it should require at least N pieces to recover the secret. And this actually has some redundancy built in. So you can have N and K be different numbers. You can have it such that you require five pieces, but you make 10. And that way, even if you lose five of them, you can still recover and you can use any of the five as long as it's five unique pieces. Um, and the key, th the key thing about Shamir's approach um, compared to sort of like a, na a naive different approach is that the unique thing about this scheme is that an attacker with N minus one shards has no more information than if they had zero shards. Um, the scheme actually has perfect security, similar to a one-time pad. And the reason for this is sort of, um, I'm the cryptographer, so I can't go into the mathematical proof, but the way I understand it is basically, um, given N minus one shards, I can construct an additional nth shard that produce, that can produce any arbitrary result. Um, meaning that uh, even with N minus one shards, the nth shard can be anything and the result can still be anything. Meaning that you have no more information from an information theory perspective um, than if you had zero shards, um, which is kind of interesting. And um, 
Therefore, the only requirement of the security system is that uh, you pick the end such that it is big enough, such that uh, you can be sure that of the people you hand it to, um, less than n, so up to n minus one, but less than n will conspire against you. Um, and as long as you have that, then you then the system is is has perfect security, um, assuming it's implemented correctly and all the rest of it. Um, so the the only real mathematics you have to understand to understand how this system works is um, th- it's this part of mathematics called the Grange polynomials. Um, but the general idea is that um, uh, is that for any given set of n plus one points, um, there is a unique n order polynomial that goes through them. So there's only one given any n plus one points. Um, and the flip side of this is that in order to reconstruct the equation of any n order polynomial, you need n plus one points from that polynomial, um, which is like x y coordinates of that of the polynomial. Um, and what this means is that any system of uh, what's called polynomial interpolation, which is a system by which given points construct a polynomial that matches them, um, any system of polynomial interpolation will give you uh, the correct original polynomial if you have n plus one points, because there's only one. So if, if it is giving you an accurate result, it must be giving you the same polynomial. Um, and that's what this system depends on. So Lagrange polynomials are sort of the most straightforward way of doing interpolation. They're not the most efficient. There are more efficient ways, but it's sort of out of scope for this discussion. Um, the general idea is, is that you can use Lagrange polynomials for this particular use case. Um, and the mathematics is pretty much straight, pretty straightforward. Um, and so what is Jamir Sikha Chering? Jamir Sikha Chering is an application of a Lagrange interpolation or any sort of poly- polynomial interpolation. Um, by what you do is that you take is that you construct a polynomial. So first you decide, okay, I want to have an n case scheme where you need n, k- n points. So you construct an n minus one-th degree polynomial. Remember, you need one extra point. So if you require five points, you make a four degree polynomial and so on and so on. Um, so you construct an n minus one-th degree polynomial uh, with completely random coefficients except you make the secret, so the part, uh, sorry, you make the um, constant term, which is the part that has an x value, you make that the secret. Um, And therefore, when you evaluate the polynomial at at x equals zero, you get the secret. And then what you do is that you give each person an xy pair, uh, where x obviously is equal to zero, you give them an xy pair, and then um, that's their pieces. You can make as many xy pairs as you like, and then you um, hand them out, and then in order to reconstruct, you just need um, n points using um, Lagrange interpolation or any other polynomial interpolation. Um, and the key, cool thing about this is that, uh, as I said, this is perfectly secure, uh, but it has to be done in finite fields. It turns out that while well, theoretically you can have an infinite number of polynomials because polynomials have to be um, have to have smooth curves, there are practical limitations. Basically, there is a, there's a theoretical attack or, or attack you can do if you don't use finite fields, but in finite fields, this is, um, this is perfectly secure. Um, and the reason why, again, is because um, there is an infinite number of nth degree polynomials that pass through any given set of n points. So if, if you have n points, which is um, one less than the amount you need, um, you can pick any point you like as the uh, as the final point, and it will give you an arbitrary polynomial. Um, that's the reason why it has perfect security. Um, so one quick uh, couple of words of warning. Um, while perfect security sounds really nice, um, uh, it's sort of like a one-time pad in that the fact that it's perfect security does not necessarily exempt you from anything else. Um, you have to be aware that it, requ- it relies on working code. Um, now, what this means is that uh, now it's sort of obvious that it requ- relies on working code, but it actually turns out that there is no really standard widely used library um, that is well audited for Shimane circuit sharing. There are a couple that are used by different people, but they're but they're all pretty much um, abandoned, I would say. There are some that are they get more development than others, but there is not really like one library that everyone uses. Like there's no open SSL for Shimane circuit sharing. Um, and the secondary problem is, is that a lot of the libraries I looked at had some sort of critical flaw. Now, some of them had less severe flaws or had like design decisions that would problematic for paperback. Um, the most common one being that they all seem to use the RSA um, Gawa field. This is getting a bit technical, but basically what this means is that um, if you use this field, which is sort of an obvious field to use, it's the same field that RSA uses. Um, the problem with using this field is that um, you can only have 255 um, coordinates, x coordinates, because it's um, because uh, it's two to, uh, the Gawa field is two to the eight, meaning there's two hundred fifty six possible x values, and you can't use x equals zero, so you have to use um, x from one to two fifty five. Um, the problem with using such a field is that um, sorry, one to two fifty six. Um, the problem with using such a field is that uh, okay, maybe you don't want to make two hundred fifty five pieces. But if you want to generate a random x value, you can't because the chance of a collision are way too high. Um, and so you need to have a bigger field, but unfortunately, most of them just use um, the 2 to the 8, the RSA field, which is a bit of a shame. Um, there were, however, there were some that had critical flaws. Um, I'm not going to name names because they fixed it, but basically there was, there was a flaw in one um, library where they mistakenly... Um, the way they initialized a vector was not ideal, and basically what ended up happening is they made it so that every single um, every single 
sharing that they created, um, I, I believe that the bug basically was that um, it was always a degree two polynomial, which meant that every single, no matter what you asked for, it would always have a threshold value of three, um, which was a bit of a problem. Now they fixed it since, but it's sort of an example of the kind of problems you need to avoid. Um, yeah, and so the other problem is, is that uh, this is sort of by design. Shamir secret sharing requires a secret to be in a single place, both at the creation and recovery time. Um, and depending on what the secret is, this might not actually be safe for you. Um, you can imagine cases where like, well, how do you know the computer doesn't have malware on it? Um, you might be the case where, well, okay, well, I want to have, um, again, so sorry to keep going back to cryptocurrencies, but the cryptocurrency example is like, well, okay, I generated an offline uh, key on my hardware wallet. I don't want to be putting that onto a computer to generate this thing. Um, yeah, there isn't really a solution to this. It sort of really depends on what people need, uh, what people want. Um, yeah, so there is a potential for single point of failure creation and recovery time. If that's not applicable to you, then um, then you should know. Um, and in addition, if you do recoveries often, uh, each recovery, you're sort of having the secret in a single place. That's pretty bad if you have to be doing it like once a week or something. Um, if you need to do recoveries often, there are almost certainly better solutions. Um, for Bitcoin, there's multi-sig, which is basically you can construct a threshold scheme which doesn't require having the secret in one place. Instead, you have multiple signatures for the same thing um obviously that doesn't help us in the backup scheme this is just purely useful for people who, who use um bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency um but that's sort of an example of something where there is another solution that is probably better suited for certain cases um but for the will and backup scheme probably this is this is what you want you probably want paperback and so then this takes us to paperback um so paperback is an application of me secret sharing but um it has a, a couple other things added to make it easier to use and also to um avoid some of the pitfalls with with using shimmy secret sharing and nothing else so the general idea is is that we take your secret and then that secret is encrypted using a cha 20 poly 1305 key that's randomly generated um and then that gives you your main document so the main document so there are two pieces there's a main document and there are your key shards the main document is the encrypted version of the secret and then the key is then split using shimmy secret sharing and then given to the to the um, shard holders. Now uh, there is also a signing key generated, and the, the reason for this I'll explain in a little bit. Um, basically, it's got to do with um, forgery detection. But effectively, there is also a signing key added, and that signing key is then used to sign all of the documents. And all of the documents contain a copy of the public half of the signing key, um, but the private half of the signing key is included with the secret. Um, the reason why it's included is, is so that we can um, create new shards after the fact. I'll explain why. I'll explain how that works in a little bit. Um, so that's the general idea. Um, and in addition to that, all of the documents contain a copy of the main document hash, again, to avoid um, forgeries, to detect forgeries. Um, and yeah, all the hashes are Blake2B256. And if you want to read more about the threat model and exactly how the scheme works, you can go read in the repo. Um, there's a design document that explains everything in, in pretty great detail. Um, so this is what the paperback documents look like. So these, these are the mockups. Um, I'll explain a little bit why I'm showing you the mockups. Um, cause I'll show you the, what the real documents look like at the moment in a little bit, but these are the mockups, but it's easy to go through the mockups cause they have all the bits that will be in the, uh, full version, um, in a little bit. In fact, by the time we're talking probably the mockups and the, um, original version, uh, the version generated by paperback probably look the same. Um, but yeah, we'll go through them. So first you have the main document header which contains a couple of critical pieces of information. So first it says what it is, main document. Um, and then you have the paperback version that was used to generate it. Um, and then you have the document ID and then you have a description of what's going on. The document ID is actually based on the checksum. Um, it's the last eight characters of the checksum, um, which means that even if you end up with forgeries and all the rest of it, as long as someone remembers what the checksum, uh, what the document ID was, um, it's unlikely you're gonna be in a situation where someone will be able to trick you into thinking that a different document is the right document. Um, but yeah, anyway, so the main document has, this is the main document of paperback backup. And then it tells you how many key shards you need, as well as how to recover it, go to this website and all the rest of it. Um, and then, yeah, so then you have the document section. So the document is encoded with several QR codes. Um, the QR codes, uh, while they have arrows here, um, uh, the QR codes can actually be scanned in any order because the QR code contains information about what QR code, what index is it in the list of QR codes, as well as how many QR codes there are. So once you scan one, you actually know how many there are, or Payback knows how many there are, and then it will tell you which ones you have scanned and which ones you haven't scanned. Um, and then the checksum, the checksum, as I said, um, is just a regular Blake to be checksum, but um, the last eight characters in this encoding are then used as the document ID um, to make it so that at least it is possible to detect a changed document um, where the checksum has changed. Um, you would detect because the document ID is different. Then you have the key shards. So so key shards are um, sort of laid out a similar way, except they're green. Um, and yeah, so key shards, it says what it is, says the version. It has the document ID listed on it so that you can match up, match them up with the um, with the document. Um, and it should be noted the document hash, the full hash of the document is included in the key shard as well. But for the human readable portion, it just has the document ID. 
and it has the shot ID. The shot ID is actually not um, from the checksum because um, uh, the shot ID is actually the X value um, of the of the um, of the share. Uh, the reason for this is that the X value is actually small enough with the scheme we use that you can just put it there. And also the X value is arguably a better way of determining uh, which shards are unique because if two shards have the same X value, then they'll have the same Y value, which means you can't use them for recovery. Um, and yeah, so that's how it looks. Um, it should not. It should be noted also. You might notice that. Um, uh, we don't say how many key shards you need. This will be obvious in a second. So you have this bit, which is the key shard data. Um, there is the QR code, and then there is a text fallback to type out. Um, we can't do this for main document because the main document obviously um, is very, it'd be very space inefficient to encode it like this. Um, but because the key shard has much, much smaller data um, payload, we have the, um, the encoder version. Um, the encoder version should be noted. Um, we use, uh, what's called ZBase32 for the encoding of the text fallback, um, which is meant to make it harder for people to, when you're reading, um, to mistake one letter for another one character for another. Um, but it should be noted, the QR code itself actually does not contain the same encoding, and it contains the same data, but it does not contain the same encoding. Um, because I discovered that if you try to use like ZBase32 um, or like any sort of um, alphanumeric um, encoding and put it in a QR code, it actually takes up more, the QR code takes up more space. Like it is, a, it is, it has a larger data payload because of how the encoding works inside QR codes. So the QR code actually uses, um, alpha, uh, uses just um, base 10 encoding. Um, it, turn, it turns out that um, this gives you almost as good as binary encoding. Uh, we can't use binary encoding because the data itself is binary encoded. And um, it, it, it's like, it has null bytes in it and things and readers don't like null bytes and you can't copy null bytes. So we use, um, just a numeric base 10 encoding, which gives us as basically as close as you can get. Um, and and Payback can, can distinguish the two because we use what's called multibase, which is um, basically there's a prefix for every single um, encoding. So we can tell which encoding it is, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, and so that's that. And then you have the checksum, which is again, a regular like to be checksum. And then you have the code words. So actually this key shard itself is encrypted. So there is a second level encryption of the, of the key shard contents. And the reason for this is that it gives the option for key shard holders to add a little bit of extra security um, by, they can optionally cut off this section and then either try to memorize it, which I wouldn't recommend, or they can store it separately. So they can have the data section and the, um, code words for the key shard in, in separate places, such that even if someone managed to break in and steal one of the pieces, it's useless without the other piece. Um, this is entirely optional. I suspect most people probably won't do this, but you know, it doesn't really cost anything to add this. Um, and you know, people can, people can do it if they like. Um, and yeah, and the, the, um, the code words are using BIP32. Um, and also the code words, obviously it says which shard and which document it is so that it's easier to, to match them up. Um, if someone does decide to cut them off. So a feature that Paperback has, which sort of sets it apart from most of the Shamir secret sharing systems, is it has support for feature which I call um, quorum expansion. Now, what this feature does, it, see, this is actually an application of how Shamir secret sharing works, like the mathematics of it. So this is something which technically any Shamir secret sharing system could support, but I'm not entirely sure why most of the systems don't support this, probably because it's a little bit inefficient to do. Um, but the general idea is, is that uh, what happens when someone loses one of their key shards? So here we have a globally distributed set of key shards. You have, um, you know, four people in Australia, one person in Europe, one person in Canada. And what happens when uh, one of the people in Australia loses their key shard? Well, you can do that. There's a naive way you can solve this and a less naive way, which is the way that Paperback does it. So the naive way of do doing this is that, well, okay, luckily there are three people in Australia and this scheme only requires three people to recover the secret. So we can recover the secret, decrypt the original document, take the secret from the document, and then we can um, construct a new document and then give every single person a new um, key shard. And the problem with the system is that this is very inefficient when you have a lot of people. And if you have people who are very globally distributed, you might find it quite difficult to actually be able to share this with, it, uh, share the key shards with everyone. Um, and obviously when you get even more people, it becomes even more ludicrous in terms of how inefficient the system is. So luckily, um, you can actually just take advantage of how the polynomial system for, for um, Shamir secret sharing works. So um, just as we are using the x equals zero interpolation to get the original secret, um, the reason why using x equals, zero is pu x equals zero is purely because it's more efficient to do it with x equals zero. Um, but you can interpolate any x value you like. Um, and thus, if we have n shards, we can use the same interpolation we're already doing, but rather than evaluating x equals zero, we can evaluate some other x, which will give us a new key shard, which is compatible with all the others. Um, there are there are more efficient ways of doing this, um, uh, which I won't get into now, but this is the general idea is that you can use the same interpolation rather than just interpolating x equals zero, you can interpolate it any other x value. Um, you can actually even reconstruct the entire, like the, all the coefficients. This isn't actually, this isn't necessary, um, but you could also do that if you wanted to, um, but that's even less, less efficient. 
And so using that, we can then take advantage of that, where we now have the same situation, and then we have three people um, who then come together for a quorum, and then you can just create a new key shard just for this one person. You can either construct it with the same um, X value, or you can construct it with a random X value. Currently, Paperback uh, constructs a random one, but it would be very, very trivial to get it to be able to construct a new one with a specific X value. Um, and that's it. And um, now, uh, the reason why we include the signing key, um, uh, the private half of the signing key inside the secret is for this reason, is for this feature. Um, because otherwise, because all the key shards are signed with the same key, um, you need to have the signing key as part of the secret so that when you do this reconstruction, you can then get the signing key and then use the signing key to then sign the new um, key shard. Without that, any new key shards would be, um, would be invalid. Um, and actually, this is where we get into the additional features. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, all the documents include both a document checksum and a signature from the signing key, as well as a copy of the public key to detect forgeries. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we have this signing key inside, the private half of the signing key inside the secret. But there is um, sort of an obvious feature to add, which Paperback has, which is that you can actually create a document that is sealed. Um, now, it should be noted that because of the mathematics, it is always possible to construct uh, new shards. That's just how the math works. There's no way of stopping this. However, because we have the signing key, um, you can create a, like a tamper evident, I would call it a document, where you can tell whether or not a new key shard, whether a key shard that is being used was created after the initial set. And the way you do that is simply that when you create the secret that you're sharing, rather than including the Ed, um, the Ed 25519 private key, you just include all zeros. And then um, you can't just remove it because then the size would be able to tell people whether a document a document is sealed or not, um, but either way, you basically don't include the key, and therefore, when you, even though you can expand it mathematically, um, the the new key, the new key shard that you've created, cannot be signed, and therefore, it is easily detectable that that particular key shard is not original. Um, and yeah, and also we have we use um, ZBase32 to make it hard to mistake characters, as I mentioned. Um, I have looked at using emoji sum to for the document identifier, um, but this has a slight flaw that well now the checksum no longer is the last eight characters, um, and also emojis might um, change over time. There are lots of issues with this particular thing, but it'd be nice to have an um, a slightly uh, still easily recognizable um, but slightly high high density um, encoding. Uh, for the checksum so that you can easily tell whether or not the checksum is as, whether or not there's a forgery or the checksum has changed or whatever. Okay, so where does paperback stand today? Well, at the moment, this is what the documents that, if you generate the documents today, this is what they'll look like. Um, I generated these yesterday. Uh, you'll see that, you know, it looks fairly similar to the sort of mockups that I have. The only thing that's really missing is sort of minor text styling as well as um, the banners that are listed. Um, the reason they're missing is sort of a very, very boring technical reason. Um, it'll be fixed soon. Basically, it boils down to the PDF generation library I use does not support um, text certification. Um, it doesn't do any sort of text formatting itself. You have to manually format everything. Um, and as a result, um, generating banners with the text all centered is a little bit complicated. Um, and I just thought it'd be better to just get something working and I'll, I'll add them later. Um, so that just requires adding a new library that does text certification and the calculation for me. Um, but yeah, that's that should be fixed um, relatively soon. In fact, it's probably fixed by the time you're watching this. Um, anyway, so uh, the current status is, yeah, is that all the paperback operations I mentioned today are completely functional um, th through the command line. Um, so you can generate PDFs, including generation of PDFs. So you can generate um, backups with, with PDFs and key shards and all the rest of it. You can do a recovery if you just copy paste the QR code data or the um, text-based backup data. If you paste it into the command line, um, and yeah, and and um, uh, expansion also works perfectly fine. Um, the only downside is that currently the styling doesn't quite yet match the mockups perfectly, um, but that's something which, which I'll, I'll fix soon. Um, the next steps or the next things that need to be worked on um, are there are a couple. Um, main ones are large documents and um, having a nice graphical interface. So large documents at the moment, we don't compress any of the data. Um, the reason with this is that I wasn't entirely sure whether it'd be safe to do so because of the crime and beast attacks, um, which were targeting um, compressed and encrypt um, schemes. However, it seems to me that those are only apply to like um, interactive scenarios where you where the attacker can give can trigger you into adding um, whatever data they want into the payload. Um, but that's not the case for paperback. Paperback is like a, it's literally, is the least interactive thing, least interactive thing you can think of where it's just, it's a printed page. So I don't know. Um, it probably is safe to compress, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'd love a cryptographer to come and tell me. Um, the other issue right now is that um, at the moment, paperback will only let you generate a single page main document. Um, the reason for this is a fairly minor um, 
it, there's not really it's not a technical limitation because as I mentioned, um, each QR code um, stores the index, and the index is using um, varints, which means that you can basically go as large as you like in terms of number of QR codes and the index of each QR code. Um, the reason why it's limited to just a single page at the moment is purely because um, I haven't quite figured out what the styling should look like when you have more than one page, and also practically speaking, it is a little bit complicated to print um, duplex pages where you have um, more than one. Like you would have to type like one comma one, two comma two, three comma three if you when you're doing the printing to get the right duplex setup um yeah the other thing is that i'm not sure about whether or not if we do end up having more than one page should we should we be able to handle if someone loses a page so that means should there be some sort of redundancy where there is like you know one extra page which is using like solomon reed or something um as a redundancy page i don't know these are all open questions i would love your, um, your feedback or opinions on this topic um, yeah, the other thing right now, and this is sort of a much bigger undertaking, is mobile or web-based applications that you can use for recovery. Because ultimately, these documents most likely will need to be recovered by your family or your heirs or whatever. If you're using it as a backup, probably you will also be able to be recovering at some point. Um, but it's very important that this is something which like an ordinary person can use. Um, and at the moment, it's a command line tool, completely useless for like ordinary people. Um, so... It'd be nice to have um, someone who is a lot better than me than graphical design. I'm absolutely awful at it, at it um, to work on some sort of graphical interface. Um, the issue right now is that also you can't scan the QR codes on desktop um, because I couldn't quite figure out how to get that work. Theoretically, it should be possible to just take a PDF or take a scan of a PDF and then do the QR code recognition on the scan. Um, and then that way it could be, we could say, okay, well, this is just a desktop only thing. Um, but at the moment, mobile phones are much, much better at um, doing QR code recognition because you can just, you can actually pick where you're scanning physically um as opposed to like if you're doing a whole page thing you would need to like find all the qr codes and all the rest of it um anyway that's something to work on in the future um and it'd be i would love some help with this because yeah i'm i'm really really bad at um <laughs> at ui design um and yeah and also some sort of computer review in order to be great um the shimmy secret sharing code um is written by me so this is a case of i um i am fairly sure that it is it is is secure i have uh, written a very large number of unit tests to make sure that um all of the main properties that have to be preserved for shimmy secret sharing are preserved um but i can't guarantee anything um there are probably places where it's not constant time whether or not constant time time matters in this particular case i don't know but yeah it'd be good to have some sort of cryptographic review and audit to double check that th things are safe and also the design is is, is um is also the same um then we have sort of open problems and this is a little bit um harder to deal with so the first problem is how do we ensure that documents that are generally paperback are actually recoverable practically in 20 30 50 100 years and um you know, I'm going to use paperback for my own stuff. So that means that you can be sure that the program will probably continue to run for at least, you know, another 20, 30, 40 years, um, as long as it's something that I need. Uh, but that's probably not enough consolation for most people. Um, so there needs to be some sort of other backup, um, just in case the program's not working, you know, the website goes down, GitHub goes down, everything goes down, that you still be able to recover it, at least in theory. Um, and so the sort of obvious solution is to have some sort of, um, is to some, have some sort of textual description of the recovery algorithm, um, or to have like a basic implementation of just the recovery code, um, in either pseudocode or Python or JavaScript or some other language, which is likely to be still usable in 50 years from now. Um, the main downside of the textual approach is that you would have to pay a developer to like actually develop a program that does the thing. Um, while, if you use pseudocode or whatever, then or it's the same thing with pseudocode, but if you use like Python or JavaScript or some other language, um, it's entirely possible that, you know, in 30 years that the language will be completely dead and no one will know how to use it. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Probably the best thing we do would be both, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, and yeah, and the other issue is whether or not we can assume the QR codes will be understood in the future. Now, we could explain how QR codes work in the textual description of the recovery algorithm, um, but that if we can't assume they know how to use QR codes, then that means we can't QR encode the code, which means it would have to be printed like regularly, which you know, it's not clear to me that that's going to be very space efficient. And like, is someone really going to have like carry on like a 20 page tome of how the system works for 40 years? Probably not. So ideally it'd be just a QR code with like the most minimal code example we can to get it to work. Um, and I've spoken to some people, some folks believe that, you know, in the future, at the very least, like archivists will be able to understand QR codes because they've been using so many different things. Um, you know, they, I mean, they're, they're used in like, I'll get to more, but they're used in like tombstones. So presumably someone in the future will understand um, what QR codes are, at least at some on some level. Um, the other question is whether or not there are any better density codes we should use. Um, data matrix or color barcodes like HCB, JAB codes, HC2D. Um, these are all, the last three are color barcode systems. Um, and data matrix is just, is a black and white barcode system, but is, um, uh, but has higher data density and can store more stuff. 
Uh, the there are trade-offs between them. Um, Data Matrix is um, I've discovered that once you get up to large sizes, the first thing is that even with QR, um, you can get higher density than I'm using here. The 900 bytes is not the the most bytes you can fit into a QR code. You can fit up to I think 3K into a QR code. The problem is is that most QR code scanners can't handle QR codes that have that much data in them. Um, I discovered them on my phone. Usually, once you get past like 1K, your phone scanner will no longer let you scan a code that has that much data on it. Um, which means, practically speaking, 1K is the practical limit of like a regular QR code that you can scan with an actual phone. Um, and similarly with Data Matrix, I find that um, Data Matrix is even more flaky when it comes to scanning. You end up with like, oh, you can scan it, but it doesn't actually detect the the code is there. Um, or it starts scanning bits of it as like a 2D barcode. Um, yeah. As for color barcodes, color barcodes have the have the capacity to be far much uh, far more um, uh, dense. The issue is, is that now, well, now you would require everyone to use color, um, uh, color printing, which is going to have its own issues. And also, um, it's not clear to me how the color will last over, you know, 40, 50 years. Um, and that's a different quite topic. So maybe, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't switch. I'd love to have, um, hear other people's thoughts on this. So finally, a very quick aside about paper storage um, with paperback. So as the name implies, paperback is a paper-based backup system, which means that taking care of the paper that you use for paperback is quite important. Um, I firmly believe that paper is arguably one of the uh, most resilient ways of storing data, but you have to treat it right. So uh, the first thing to consider is sort of the obvious one, which is that you probably want to print everything double-sided with like full duplex, um, where such that if one side gets slightly damaged, the other side will still be readable. Um, in addition, you want to use archival grade acid-free paper over regular copy paper. Regular copy paper has acid in it, which slowly eats away at the paper and the ink, um, which means that over you know 50 years, it, the paper pages will become yellowed and also the ink itself will start to get damaged, um, which, means, which means it might be impossible to read in 50 years time, which you want to avoid. Um, in addition to that, you want to avoid uh, hot lamination, um, which is sort of what you and I think of when we think of laminating something, which is that, you know, with the hot rollers and you have the sleeve you put it in that then melts into the paper. Um, the problem is, is that the, this, the first of all, the melting process is quite, um, is irreversible pretty much. And so, um, you're put like permanently bonding this to the paper, the plastic of the paper. And also the material that's used inside, um, pouches is, um, is not entirely inert. It's actually slightly, um, slightly reactive, which means that it is slowly reacting with the paper, meaning that it will actually cause the paper to degrade faster than it would normally. Um, and in addition, um, if there's any oils or anything inside the on the paper when you sealed it, those are sealed in with with the with the plastic. Um, what you should use instead is what's called encapsulation sleeves. Basically, they are sleeves that are made of an inert material where you can put the paper inside and then you can tape up one of the ends or you can, um, you know, thread the end together or whatever you prefer. And that way it is, the page is protected from spills, which is the main reason why you would laminate something. Um, but, but at the same time, you can take it out and the um, sleeve itself is made of an inert material such that it won't react with the paper itself. Um, yeah, so these are just sort of general guidelines. I'm not an archivist. This is sort of what I um, gleaned from reading up a little bit about it. Um, national libraries usually have pretty good archival advice. The um, Australian National Library um, used to have some pretty good information on their website, but ever since they changed it a couple of years ago, I wasn't able to find it. If you go to paperback, I have archive links to the original page, uh, original pages, which um, details some of this stuff in detail. Um, in addition to the, Cana the Canadian Conservation Institute um, has pretty good information. They have like very detailed documents about not just how to, what, like what side of paper you should use, but also how you should store it, what kind of boxes you should use to store it and all the rest of it. Probably a little bit too detailed for like most users of paperback, um, but it's something you should at least have in mind to consider when you're, when you're printing this stuff. Um, and with that, uh, that's everything. So, any questions? Okay, thank you, Alexa, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, first of all, could you just let uh, the audience know where they can obtain those slides and uh, any other links? Yeah, sure. So you can get the slides from cipher.com slash talks or uh, my GitHub, which is github.com slash cipher, C-Y-P-H-A-R slash um, talks. Great. Now we have a few questions available in the chat window. So first of all, how large can the secret practically be? Yeah, so um, at the moment, because we don't do any compression, um, the secret is a, a limited to about like 8K or 9K um, bytes. Um, the In theory, if you did compression, you could bump, out, bump it up a little bit more. Um, but as I mentioned, there are, there are some limits, size limits with QR codes. So you are, you are sort of practically limited at the moment. Um, in the future, I do plan to... Um, have like multi-page support. I think I mentioned that in, in, in the in the last bit. Um, with that, you can make it like as long as you as big as you like. Effectively, um, there is like a theoretical limit of like two to the thirty-two because of the because um, of the field we use. Um, but like that's more bytes than anyone ever needs in, in a lifetime. 
Great. And um, how do you think that we are, you will get paperback as a project to a point where people will trust that paperback will still be readily available and usable over the time scale people care about for digital wills? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it's it's a problem that has sort of stuck with me because it's, it's not really an obvious solution. Um, I think that there are a couple of things that you can that I can do to make it less uh, dependent on me specifically. Um, one of them was, um, as I mentioned, I, you can I can work on making it so that there is like a self-contained description of how to um, decrypt the data so that you can go to anyone who knows how to like use a computer and knows how to run like a Python program or whatever um, can decrypt it. And I think that that would go a long way. Um, you know, there are a couple of other options, um, you know, like, I don't know, maybe there's like Internet Archive ways of doing it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm entirely open to discussions about ways of improving that because I, I do agree that it is... Um, you know, if if it, if it wasn't me, if it was someone else, I would also be quite hesitant about leaving something that I need to that needs to be used by my heirs in fifty years. That seems um pretty dodgy. So yeah, um, yeah, it's it's a difficult question, but I think that those things can probably improve it. So work in progress. Yes. Okay, and which finite field are you using in the end? Uh, yeah, so we're using uh, GF two to thirty two, like the um, Gawa field two to thirty two, um, and the this is a bit technical, but the um, the char uh, characteristic polynomial is like sort of like uh, um, the most obvious one. It's the smallest when you're represented in binary. It's the smallest one, um, but yeah, it's just um, yeah. The reason why we use um, GF thirty two is because um, so two to the thirty two um, is because um, using like a prime field. Um, uh, as far as I can tell, it's difficult to make a prime field that is actually um, uh, that is efficient, like that is it is well. Sorry, it is efficient. Um, the issue is is that you have to deal with that it's pr usually not constant time, uh, and also it's kind of difficult to like easily chunk up data in it that way. Um, so yeah, we just use the the Gawa to the blah field, which is thirty two in this case. Um, yeah. Excellent. Okay, so in the absence of any other questions, uh, thank you for the presentation, and we'll end the video there. Okay. Thanks for watching.